All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Founders Cut. Today, I'm here with Jenny, CEO and founder of Stage Time. Uh, you know, and as you know by now, we don't jump straight into the product or the opportunity. We jump into learning more about the person behind the logo. So, Jenny, if you could just take a moment to talk about your journey to becoming a founder. You know, what were you doing before this? What, what made you find this aha moment? Sure. Sounds good. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, so before making my way to stage time, I was working as an opera singer. Um, when I was working, my friends were starting to win these really, really cool, big, notable gigs, like with the Met and Cirque du Soleil and on Broadway. And I was starting to notice that the materials that represented them never looked nearly as good as they were professional. Um, and I was getting pretty frustrated by that as a member of the industry. And so I started by designing websites for my peers um, who were at this phase of their career where they had something that they really needed to represent them. And in particular, one of my friends had won the Metropolitan Opera competition that year and was being featured by the New York Times. So I redid her website first and that brought in a ton of new requests. Um, so I learned about the supply and demand issue as far as how many artists felt like they needed this type of representation. So I ran a service business design studio um, and serviced over 2,000 artists and arts organizations. We scaled with templates. We maintained these sites because it's a dynamic, um, high-velocity gig economy, which meant that the information fell out of date over and over and over again every time these people got hired. Um, so finally, we said, wow, this really doesn't feel like the right solution for people. And when we took a step back and looked at really how they were being leveraged, we saw that they were always being leveraged as industry tools. We're not talking fans writing in and asking for a signed headshot to be mailed to them. Um, we're looking at folks who are saying, what's your visa status in Berlin? And do you have a 250 word headshot? And has your agent's contact info changed? Are you available on March 11th? Um, and we felt like that was the type of thing that for many artists shouldn't come at a steep, steep cost of several thousand dollars, given that the, the rest of the professional world is networked on LinkedIn. And so um, I felt like I wanted to tackle that problem as somebody who had sat there with artists trying to help them solve manually. And that's what brought me to stage time. Yeah, I think that's a great um, uh, comparison LinkedIn for like the the traditional professional world, like the white collar world of of employment, but not necessarily when when we first talked um, uh, weeks back. My first thought was, oh, you're taking what looks like Craigslist ads and turning it into more like Airbnb ads for rental properties. And it's not the best example, but it was like, to me, that was the first kind of point of connection that I can make. It's like all these people doing it ad hoc on their own. It doesn't look the best, but now you're creating a platform to allow people to do it easier, do it more cleanly, make it more look professional and and spend less time doing the stuff they don't want to do so they can do more, spend more time on the things they, that they do want to do. Um, so tell me a little bit more about the initial days, you know, when you first got started, um, did you just try it for yourself and then saw that it worked and decided to, to then scale it or, or were there a bunch of people that just kind of came to you and said, Hey, we looked at your site. It's beautiful. Can you make mine look the same way? Well, that was how the websites happened. That was very much just every time we published one, there were 10 to 15 to 30 that would come back. These people had these big micro networks and it's a very, um, it's a very insular industry. So a lot of the people who work in the industry are audience members and you find a lot of overlap there. So it's, it's heavily networked, which is sort of notorious. It's a word of mouth industry, which is another reason why we had so much conviction in the power of network for this particular group. So that was how the websites themselves spread. Um, but as I transitioned over to thinking more and more about stage time, I was I was interviewing folks in my network relentlessly, arts administrators, professors, um, all types of artists that I had worked with. And it was a pretty resounding yes across the board. And um, I'm not technical. So my first, my knee jerk reaction was not to, you know, start scoping out a technical product, but I could visualize because I had this at the very least, I had some design chops, which I, I think are an amazing thing for any entrepreneur because you can pull things out of your brain and turn them into things that people can see, or at least non-technical mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. So I designed the profiles first. That's all I knew. It, I knew what that should look like. And um, immediately somebody questioned it and said, why is the photo 50% of the screen? That's the worst UX I've ever seen. That's a terrible use of space. That's one of the primary things that sold all of these artists on the early days of stage time. Um, you're spending 
thousands of dollars on these headshots. And mm -hmm. that really represents the product that people are getting. There's just no way to remove that name, image, and likeness and all those soft components from these people who are ultimately going to show up in person to do a very specific, very visual hands-on thing. Um, so when people started to see those profiles, I think they could see themselves in them. And I had friends who didn't even know what it was yet. And they were like, that's cool. I want that. Is that for artists? What is that? A, a really, you know, pimped out Wikipedia page. Uh, um, I think people saw that it might make them feel like an entity switch from going to I am Jenny to JennyMoser.com, the soprano. And I think people saw that in the UX. And so that drove a number of signups to our wait list. And that's really what got the ball rolling on the product. Is there video aspects for people to show off their capabilities? Because you talked about different forms of art that you support. Can can people upload clips or is it just kind of like a snapshot profile that that you're letting people upload into? So yes, I think we are actually much closer in a lot of ways to being a CMS for these individuals than we are to just being a LinkedIn. And that shows up in the usage too. People spend 30 minutes a month with stage time versus about 17 a month with LinkedIn. Um, and they tweak those profiles relentlessly. They change every color. They test every layout. They pull in every single one of them. It feels like MySpace. Entities. I don't know if you were yes. around when MySpace no. was. <laughs> Absolutely. It's my space like behavior. I mean, when people realized that their connections showed up, I had friends reaching out and saying, can I control who shows up there? Because I want it to be the three biggest names I've worked with. Because in a gig economy, you don't just get to say, hey, I'm Jenny and I work at stage time. And there's some level of, hey, I know what that means. It's a long-term stable job, whatever. I have these things associated with it. As a performer, you're saying, well, I was in Madison, Wisconsin last week, and trust me, that was a great gig, but next week I'm at the Met, and you're constantly pulling together different criteria. So yes, we wanted people to be able to lead with both the data and the, or the data and pedigree and the media, because typically the, the sort of uh, validating process for a performer happens in two ways. You either hear or see them perform, and you think, whoa, that person's amazing, what's their deal? And you wanna look up the criteria that made them sound great, or you read a resume and you think, whoa, that person has insane credits. I would love to hear them. So prioritizing both of those in one fell swoop above the fold was sort of what we were getting at in the profile. You know, it's funny, you talked about resume and pre pedigree impressing people, but you can talk to anyone in the regular corporate world that rips their hair out because they made a decision based on just the lines on a paper, but not actually the ability to perform, right? So. You know, you could have someone that looks amazing um, from top to bottom in terms of where they've been, what they've done, the types of skills that they say they have, but then you hire them and you find out that they actually are not good at any of that stuff. They just were good at faking it till they get the role. And, you know, it's funny because obviously this is focused on a certain subset of people, but I think as I look at the new world today with AI and the ability to like manufacture the perfect resume with just using artificial intelligence and it's going to be so hard for people to actually um, discern who should and who shouldn't get uh, an actual shot at a job interview, right? And so I feel like this should be something that should be integrated into even like normal traditional roles because I would much rather put myself up against somebody by showing how good I can perform, right? Totally. Put me in a room with somebody and have me interview a founder versus some other, you know, managing par partner at another fund, right? And let's see who actually the investor should invest in. Same thing with what you're doing. It's it's phenomenal to think that like, I think that's where LinkedIn needs to go in the future. They need to actually show proof of ability, not just proof of like bullet points, right? So uh, I think well, they, that's, yeah. that's a great thing that you're, that you're offering for these people. They keep saying they will, right? And then they turn on creator tools and it's about the most data-driven version of creator tools I've ever seen, which is which is great. But to your point, when you're hiring, you're looking or investing, um, you're looking to do the maximum amount of de-risking that you can possibly do. And I think to your point, de-risking from a flat page is is nearly impossible. Yeah. Frankly, building relationships and de-risking via Zoom is, is his own beast and is sort of tough. So I think that, and that's how we see people consume them. You know, well, it's a little bit of a video, read all the credits, get deeper and deeper. It's never like sit there and pour through the bio and nothing else. Or... And that's why I do these podcasts, right? Cause you can send a cold email out to an investor or a potential customer. You can, you know, try to connect with them on LinkedIn through messages, but there's something special about being able to see someone actually interacting with somebody else or uh, doing their doing their craft right and i think 
I think that's the special sauce that you're probably um, definitely tapping into for sure. Um, you know, let's talk about some of the impact that you made for um, performers. Um, you know, the world before stage time existed versus the world today. Like what kind of um, responses have you gotten? How, like the feedback that you've gotten maybe? KPIs in terms of before I would have to have this much time spent on, you know, updating and reaching out now, it's it's 10 times faster or whatever. Do you have any um, in information like that that you'd be happy to share? Yeah, so early on, I started this right before, I mean, late, late 2019, early, early 2020. So truly right before, you know, COVID catalyzed how everyone was thinking about this type of process. But early on, it was folks saying, whoa, this is the first time I've ever seen my network represented somewhere outside of like maybe trying to pick industry professionals off of Instagram by looking, you know, say, say you're looking for a cellist to perform on a recital with you because you've gotten this gig, you're going to go perform in Arizona, you need a cellist. And all of a sudden you're on Facebook looking for people you went to school with that have cellos in their profile pictures. And that's, that's like how you get the work and um, so that's sort of one version of just seeing your network physically represented somewhere when you need any level of transaction. Sure, there's like the gig, you're hiring someone, you need a job. But a lot of the times I use LinkedIn and get value out of it. It's not sales navigator or recruiter. It's, hey, I'm new to Salt Lake City and I'm looking I'm, I'm looking to interact with X. You know, it's, it's a lot more building those quality transactions over time. So that's part of what we're trying to do for people as well. Um, before you would need to probably choose a, a CMS system and build your own website, which is not the end of the world, but we're talking about folks who spent, I, for example, didn't have to take any sort of math course in college. I had very few things that took me away from the stage, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a problem, but even my peers on our team at stage time have been shocked by some of the artist requests. Like, Hey, I don't know how to export as a PDF mm. and they're like shocked and floored. And it's just, you know, try to gently remind you don't package up your work and send it to people to do your job. You walk into the theater, put your phone away and pull out an instrument. Like mm. you don't interact at all. And it's not that these people are incapable. It's just not part of the workflow in the same way. So I think it's a disproportionate ask to say, okay, go and you're probably going to need, so you need to go get headshots. You're going to need to self produce and self record everything. Once you've acquired all of that content, you're going to need to create your own website, hook it all up, drive traffic to it through multiple social channels, all to the end of getting hired and they're gig. probably not even good at it. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but no, if you're they're if not. not your core competency, then you're going to do it at like a 20% efficiency. So you're putting all this additional time in, probably 200% extra time in to do something that gets you 20% the efficiency. That and they that hate it. Be. Yeah, They hate it. My best clients were the people who said, I tried to make my own website last weekend and it was horrible. It mm -hmm. was the worst decision I've ever made. Please, can you help me? And we see that happening with stage time. Now we're seeing people who are in notable symphonies coming online and saying, this is the first time I've ever understood what to put in a website or in a portfolio online. Because when you are a trombonist and you get on LinkedIn and it asks you what your title is, you immediately go, mm, I feel really foolish here. I don't think they're looking for trombonists. I think they're looking for product manager. So I think giving people that instantaneous feedback allows them to cut down on the decision making time, which which I think is a is a kindness to give people. Mm -hmm. And that's where I like to think a lot about what Canva has done for the creative community in terms of, hey, here's a set of tools and structure that gives you a lot of gives you a massive running head start, gets you 95 percent of the way to an amazing finished product, but leaves you with significant agency knowing their audience. And I think that's a, that's an amazing thing not to put people in a position where it's, you know, make 100% of your decisions, design every square, every line of copy, every UX decision versus, Hey, this should generally get you where you need to go. And we've given you this optionality for controlling it beyond that. So yeah, that that's something sense. we've been really excited to do for folks. So Walk me through the user experience for a, a performer or an artist that wants to 
um, jump on your platform for the first time? You know, first, how do they find you? And second, you know, how much time should they anticipate to get, you know, something out the door and uh, online? The number one way that they find us, they report is that a friend had a stage time profile, um, which is a you know tricky thing to quantify that network. But nine times out of 10, it's, oh, my friend X had a stage time profile and I liked the way it looked. It looked like it was for me. So I came and signed up. Um, when they sign up, we walk them through an onboarding that gets them basically set up. And our primary, our primary mission, which this is going to sound I mean, completely obvious to any anybody who has any touch points with product regularly here, but we are working to get them integrated into our database in a way that is going to allow them to build their network outward, um, which I think is often lost on people. They'll say, you know, they'll just set up a profile and say, when do I start getting hired? And we really have to walk them through, hey, where did you go to school? Who else might you know that would be in your network who would be posting relevant opportunities? And um, we deal with sort of a disproportionate level of comfort and education around technology, which I know many sectors do, but it's it's the cost of working in the deskless um, in the deskless sort of future of work space. Um, so we really try to make it something that feels we've had people call our onboarding fun, which I think is very nice, um, especially for artists. And then we land them on the profile and they usually start building right away. Um, and the sections that are going to be available to them are going to hopefully make instantaneous sense to an artist who's working in the community. But you can be completely set up and reach 100% profile completion in about 10 minutes, especially if you have content nearby. Um, and the great part is once you're once you're set up in that way, you can connect a URL to your stage time profile and they crawl really, really well on Google because we've invested pretty heavily in trying to help manage the mm -hmm. SEO for an individual user. So we like to say that you can get set up and Googleable within 10 minutes. No, that's uh, that's huge uh, and probably like a little bit of burying the lead because that's what everyone wants, right? They want their name to be typed in and then if, they're, if they want to be found, they want to be found on the first page first three lines, whatever it is. Um, obviously you're building a, a, a new venture. And so we'd be, you know, we'd be dropping the ball if we didn't talk about opportunity size, right? Like how big of an opportunity is it that you're going after? Okay. So I love to talk about this because the live performing arts um, is way bigger than people think that it is. When we look at the market from the bottom up, it's about three and a half million people and it's about 50,000 organizations and at pretty modest price tiers, that's at least a billion and a half dollar opportunity. So I'm not here to tell you that it's the biggest opportunity in the world, but I think when you start to look at the types of professionals that are participating there, they're interesting for a couple of different reasons. One, there are more of them than people expect. Two, they're highly educated. They are the type of valuable, almost white collar looking user that LinkedIn has gone after. Most of our users have one or more degrees. A lot of them have two degrees, highly skilled, highly educated. Um, and they're tied to the same really valuable data nodes, again, that LinkedIn has created. We're talking about people who went to you know, the Cincinnati College Conservatory at the University of Cincinnati or Northwestern or Indiana. You can tell I went to Big Ten schools, but we're talking about people who are for better or for worse, tied to data nodes that are super, super useful when you're making hiring decisions. As fallible as they are, we've already talked about the dangers of reading off of a paper resume. There's still a component of it. And that's your professional network. No matter what industry you work in, that is the, that is the first professional network you will ever be part of. So I think these people are missing out massively. Um, and I think that the larger workforce is missing out massively by being disconnected from, again, three and a half million professionals who are just as highly educated as the sector that's already been proven out as valuable. What's um What's your primary, obviously right now it's individuals, but you know if I look at the next stage of growth, are you trying to get more organizations to partner with you so you can then offer the product to more people um, easier? I don't know if it works that way, but to me, it seems like if you can get organizations to come on board, maybe it's like a notable school that has a really big program and get them to pay for the platform, then all their you know, students or alumni can get on the network. And I don't know, like, is that is that kind of where you think the bigger opportunity is or is it just focusing on the 3.5 million individuals? I really, I, I hate to play down the middle, but I do think it's both. I think it eventually looks very much like LinkedIn, where there's a set of tools that more overtly benefit small businesses, organizations, enterprises. 
Um, I think those are likely activated by individuals. So I'm looking at, you know, the first person who activates LinkedIn recruiter versus tackling it from the lens of where can I go and sell 10 licenses, especially because of the dynamic gig economy aspect, for example, a casting director or an agent, uh, you know, a huge power of power user of hours. They often may be free agents. They might actually be an individual who is going out and recruiting as a freelancer on behalf of lots of different theaters. Um, so we're really excited about activating that particular tranche of user. And that's what we've been focused on. And that's where we've seen results in the hiring respect. And of course, to service them, we spend a lot of our time investing on the supply side and those profiles and making sure that, um, you know, we can't control the, the, who subjectively should be per, part of the performing arts industry. Um, and so the best thing that we can do for people who are looking for talent is provide maximum information for de-risking that person so they can immediately tell, this is what I'm looking for, this is not what I'm looking for. On the organization side, to your point, we have partnered with the Aspen Music Festival and School and with Wolf Trap Opera to sort of develop what that relationship could look like. Um, and the good news is it tracks very much with what we've already built in the community we have today. Um, those recruiting and casting tools get a lot more powerful as we generate that critical mass. Mm -hmm. So those partnerships are really beneficial to us today as those channel partners sort of to your part. Um, we're excited to get to the bottom of the recruiting tool and, you know, the long tail benefit with critical mass. Um, but in the interim, um, since there is a relationship there to having critical mass within these really, really highly specific verticals and markets, we're excited to be partnering with those organizations to learn about what they're looking for out of the platform from a top-down perspective, while we've also been servicing the individual who's already leveraging the platform pretty heavily. Yeah, I can't help but keep thinking of it in the same way that, you know, student athletes that want to get recruited to go to universities have to build out their profiles. It'd be super cool to see like a stage time junior for kids that are trying to, you know, build out their resumes and, and get noticed by institutions, organizations, universities and whatnot down the road. But, you know, obviously maybe they can't afford it yet or whatnot, but, you know, I think you could, the pipeline could start so far upstream. That'd be really cool to see uh, in the future. It's crazy that you say that because I think I mentioned last time we talked that I had a new co-founder who joined us a couple of months ago and he's a founder and his former company was a marketplace for stats in the youth mm. sports market because parents were willing to pay so steeply to generate things like highlight reels, which is sure. what his company did, breakdowns um, to generate these highlight reels to send to colleges from these club sports teams. And so he was working in the marketplace space, selling this game film with coaches and clubs mm -hmm. and also directly to parents and students. And um, yeah. He, yeah, he was an athlete himself. So we, we think about that name, image and likeness comparison a lot. And our, our primary mission today is, you know, as much as it feels like a narrow focus is to get towards insane product market fit with these people. Because to your point, I think there's a pretty significant opportunity to become the CMS for this type of individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think there's a huge opportunity. It's always cool. You know, you talked about um, for some people, it might not seem like a big opportunity, but oftentimes in venture, it's about finding that happy medium of not too big of an opportunity where everyone's chasing after it, but not too small where it's not venture backable. And, you know, when you talk about the numbers of 3.5 million and 50,000, uh, you know, organizations, that's the type of place if no one else is buying for positioning and you're the first to do it, it that's how you that's how you win right so very very cool um you know as we kind of get close to the end uh anything that you want to throw out there people should keep an eye out for or just anything you want to shout out feel feel free we'd love for you to kind of just be, be able to talk about whatever you want Ooh, um let me think or any types of folks you want to connect with too yeah you know all yeah there. Um, we're growing fast right now. Our community is growing fast. Um, we're especially excited to stay focused in the performing arts right now. Um, so as such, we're really always very, very excited to talk to folks who are also ready to get excited about the creator economy with us, um, who are excited about finding crazy product market fit in an interesting group like this. I think it's a specific kind of person and we've got several on our cap table and they've been um, amazing, um, especially when you bring in the marketplace and the social aspect. So if um, if any of those angles sound like you, that is always the type of person we're interested in speaking with. But first and foremost, those who have some interest and excitement about the live performing arts space as a, 
as a really interesting opportunity to sure. kick off sort of the work that we're doing today. Absolutely. One last question. Any advice for any founders out there listening? Mm, get a dog because <laughs> um, they don't know what computers are, which is the best thing about them. They just want you to and close your laptop. <laughs> absolutely. Mine comes and puts his paw on top of mine. Very straightforward communication out of him, which I appreciate as well. Um, get a dog. And if you're non-technical, I learn a design program. I just think there's amazing power in being able to say, no, that's not what I was talking about. This is what I was yeah. talking about. Um, it just always cuts down on the imperfection of language. And if you're, if you're non-technical, there's already going to be a, you know, a, a tough road ahead in terms of getting your ideas and their execution across. So arm yourself with a design tool. Yeah. I love that feedback because if you force yourself to design it, oftentimes you realize, oh, that might not actually be something I can actually make work. And so it kind of filters your own brain a bit to say like, I need to design something that even I can describe to people. And if I can't describe it, it might be too expensive or not the right time to build it anyway. So I, definitely, I like that, I like that um, advice. Um, well, so for folks that are listening, if you're a performer, artist, creator, investor, organization that works with groups like this, um, please do reach out to Jenny. Um, I think you'll really enjoy seeing the platform. I've taken a look at it. It looks, looks very polished. It looks looks beautiful right and i can I, I know some folks not a lot like maybe one or two that are in the space and I, I remember them having like paper portfolios that they would take to different different gigs and whatnot it'd just be so much more refreshing if they could send a qr code that they that the judges could just scan a little little item and, and get it down the road so i see a, i see a world where this becomes pretty much like uh the you know just baseline level of thing for people in your space so very very cool um, well, thank you so much again for your time. Uh, and this was really fun and, and I look forward to seeing where you guys go in the future. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for the conversation. Much appreciated.